Welcome everyone to the Balancing Act with Bay State Health Experts. Today we have Erin Jarris, Supervisor for Bay State Rehabilitation Care, Ida Kondowitz, Registered Nurse with Bay State Health Injury, Injury Prevention, Danielle Adams, Pharmacist for Bay State Pharmacy, Michelle Latane, <coughs> OT with Bay State Rehabilitation Care, and Nancy Densmore, physician, yeah, physical therapist assistant with Bay State Rehabilitation Care. <clears throat> Just to mention uh, for today, all attendees will be muted, but we do invite you to type in your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end of the event. So welcome everyone. And uh, our first speaker <clears throat> today, is Ida Kondowitz. Welcome, Ida. Thank you. Thank you all for having us. Today, um, I'm going to be talking to you about falls. Um, and uh, I'm Ida Kondowitz, the Injury Prevention Coordinator for Bay State Health. And our objectives are going to be, we're going to define a fall, identify personal risk factors to falls, discuss the injuries as a result of a fall, and identify strategies to prevent falls. The World Health Organization defines a fall as an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground or floor or other lower level. Falls are common and leading cause of injury in 65 years and older, and they have serious consequences. Fall data from the CDC, I want to share with you, approximately 100,000 Americans turn 65 each day. One in four Americans age 65 and older fall each year. Half will fall again. Every 11 seconds, an older adult is treated in the emergency room for a fall, and every 19 minutes, an older adult dies from a fall. Falls are the leading cause of loss of independent living. I like to explain statistic number two. Half will fall again because they develop a fear of falling. They reduce or stop their daily activities. They fear leaving their homes, and they fear just to be active in general. So this, in turn, causes functional decline, muscle weakness, and loss of balance. The brain is one of the largest and most complex organ of our body. It weighs approximately three pounds. It is responsible for the intelligence, the database of memories, the interpreter of our senses, and the director of all movements. It defines who we are, how you act, and how you think. Each section has a function in your body. And they are called the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, the cerebellum, and the brainstem. As an example, the frontal lobe is responsible for problem solving, emotional traits, reasoning, speaking, and voluntary activity. If any of these are injured, it will define who you are and you won't be yourself anymore. Some brain injuries are coup contra coup. When you experience high impact to your head from a fall or an accident, it displaces your brain to the opposite side, creating more trauma, resulting in brain bruising to the frontal lobe. As you can see in this picture, your brain moves inside your skull and it causes damage to the occipital lobe, the back of your head. Most people are unaware that a concussion is a traumatic brain injury. You can have mild to severe symptoms and it can affect your thinking and remembering, physical issues, emotional issues, and sleep. You can have mild symptoms with difficulty thinking clearly, headaches, irritability, and sleeping more than usual, or severe with di difficulty remembering new information, feeling tired, and having no injury, no energy, nervousness, anxiety, and could have any one of the sleep disorders. When you do have a concussion, you need to realize that you have to have cognitive brain rest as well as physical rest, and cognitive brain rest means not watching TV, not playing on the computer or your phone. Here at Bay State Health, we do have a concussion, um, regional concussion experts such as MDs, PTs, and OTs. And you can call for an appointment if you choose, if you're having symptoms. We're going to talk about an epidural and a subdural hematoma. It's basically bleeding in your brain. And a subdural hematoma is a result of a, ve a vein being injured and bleeding into your brain. Depending on how much blood is there, you can be admitted to the hospital and monitored, or you may need to have an intervention by a neurosurgeon. An epidural hematoma is 
when there's an injury to an artery inside your brain, and this is a very quick blood loss, and they can become very large, and you will need an intervention by a neurosurgeon. Other fall-related head injuries can result in skull fractures, and some of those are called linear fractures, compound fractures, and depressed fractures. Spinal cord injuries. The vertebrae have, are 33 bones that protect your, your spinal cord. They interlock together to form the spinal column. The vertebrae are divided into regions called the cervical vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae, the lumbar vertebrae, sacral and coccyx vertebrae. And a fracture of one of these vertebrae can result in bone fragments pinching the nerves or the spinal cord result as a result of a fall. And injuries, as you can see from the, the four figures that, that have highlighted in red, depending on where the break and injury to the spinal cord, you could have paralysis as an example from the neck down in red. And then if you are injured in your thoracic spine, it could be from your waist down, et cetera. Injuries of the neck and spine. This is just an image of an individual who sustained a spinal cord injury and they have to rely on machinery and require assistance from diverse medical team and medical staff. I wanna introduce you to um, base state body bones. Um, as you can see, we have a lot of bones, different sizes, different shapes. And when you fall, any one of these bones can be fractured. And um, as you can see the femur, it's your thigh bone, which is very large, and your pelvis, which are very large bones as well. Rib fractures are one of the most common bones that are broken after a fall. You have 12 pairs of ribs, seven are attached to your sternum and your vertebrae, three are connected through cartilage, and two are floating and connected to the vertebrae. There are serious complications as a result of rib fractures, such as injuries to your lungs, to your heart, to your diaphragm, or your esophagus. Upper extremity fractures include clavicle fractures, humerus fractures, ulnar and radius fractures. And if you fracture these, you impact your daily self-care, driving, homemaking tasks, work, and leisure activities. And lower extremity fractures, as you saw in Bobby Bones, and I pointed out how large the, the femur is. And when that is broken or fractured, you can lose 1.5 liters of blood from the femur and it's a result of tears in the blood vessels that surround the femur attached to the ligaments to the bones. Another uh, fracture or lower extremity fractures include the pelvis. The pelvis uh, is a very highly vascular, which means that they have very large vessels, such as arteries, and you can distinguish them in the red. And if the pelvis is broken and they cut those arteries, you can have a large amount of hemorrhage in that area. And it also impacts your function daily of your just lower body dressing, self-care, and all around sit to stand transfers. Medications that can contribute to a fall, we're gonna have Danielle speak to you next. So the only thing I want you to take away from this slide is know who your pharmacist is and uh, know what you're taking and why you're taking them. Age-related vision loss um, can result in decreasing your ability to adjust to light decline in depth perception and decrease vision at night. Some tips and tricks that you can do to keep and help you so that your vision stays, um, so that you can see things better is keep your glasses clean, have yearly eye exams, mark your steps and thresholds so that you can see them, improve lighting in your bathroom, bedroom and hallways by having night lights everywhere. Because at nighttime, if you're in a dark room and you flip the switch on, that bright light is going to um, cause you to not be able to see clearly. But if you have some light coming into your room by a night light, you probably will be able to see a little bit better and accommodate to that and, and not trip and fall. And we want you to decrease the clutter and keep your space organized. Hearing is also decreased as, as you age um, and it will limit your social activities lower one's feelings of good health and cutting off relationships with friends and families. So some of the tips and tricks that we would like you to try is use appropriate hearing aids and assisted technology. Get in closer. Don't try to listen to someone from the other side of the room. Go to where the talker is. Ask a person to turn so that you can see his or her face. Let the speaker know when you have trouble hearing or understanding and always have a spare hearing aid battery on hand. Who is on your team? You are the captain of your team. 
and you need to know your players. You need to know your primary care physician, your ophthalmologist, your physical therapist. I think your pharmacist should be your best friend if you're on many medications, your occupational therapist, your nurse, your audiologist, and your support team. Six steps to prevent falls in the, from the National Council of Asians. Find a good balance and exercise program. The key to not falling is to catch yourself from falling by having a strong core and strong legs. Talk to your healthcare provider and let them know you've fallen and refer you to a good balance program so that you can gain those strengths and skills. Regularly review your medications with your doctor and your pharmacist. Have your vision and hearing checked annually and update your glasses. Keep your home safe and decluttered so that you're not tripping over cords and throw rugs and talk to your family members and let them know that you've fallen. Falls are not part of the aging process. Most falls are preventable, some we cannot prevent, but what we want you to do is to be strong so that you can have a strong core, strong legs, and be able to stop that fall from occurring. And if you do have questions, please type them into the um, chat box. And now I'm gonna introduce Danielle Adams, our pharmacist extraordinaire. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Danielle Adams. I am uh, one of the emergency medicine pharmacists here at Bay State Medical Center. So I work uh, down in the emergency department. So uh, today I just want to talk a little bit about how some of the medications you might be on can uh, relate to the risk of falling. So the medications, they can contribute to falls or increase your fall risk uh, in multiple ways. So one is directly affecting your, uh, your central nervous system. So making you drowsy or feel sedated. You might feel dizzy or lightheaded. They can impair your coordination. So you might have an unsteady gait um, or it can blur your vision. So you might not see things that are directly in front of you. Um, and then also there are medications uh, lowering your blood pressure or your blood sugar. Um, which can make you feel faint and lead to syncope or passing out, can also make you feel dizzy or lightheaded. And then also you can have an unsteady gait um, if these uh, occur as well. Uh, so I'd just like to say that it is important to take your medications as prescribed. So many of the medications that, I'm, that you might see listed uh, later on in the presentation they are necessary medi uh, medications, so it might not be possible to avoid using them. Um, so if you have questions about it, do not stop any of the medications on your own. Make sure that you talk to your provider or your pharmacist. Um, and that if you are on any of these medications, it's just important to monitor the side effects and how the drugs make you feel and then discuss that with your provider. So if um, you're getting a new medication or even medications that you get regularly if you want to know if any of the side effects that can increase, that if any of these medicines have uh, side effects that could increase your risk of falling, the medication info sheet that comes from your pharmacy, the first four symptoms on the list are the most common, so you want to be able to look through that um, and see if you can recognize any of those side effects. And uh, also, I uh, wanted to note to use caution, especially when you're adding new medications, um, because combining medications that have similar side effects um, can increase your risk of falling. You might be fine taking just one on its own and have no effects, but adding another one could kind of change things a little bit, and it might be... Um, it might affect you differently at that point. And then also increasing doses of current medications. Uh, your body can take some time to adjust to the new doses or the new medications. So just take things a little easy and be aware of how these changes um, are making you feel. So jumping into some of the meds um, and kind of going along with uh, the last comment about adding multiple medications that have similar side effects. So here we have common groups of medications. We have opioids. So um, I have some examples of medications listed here. These lists are by all means not all inclusive. Uh, they're just examples. So if you are taking meds that are not 
listed in this presentation at all, but you still do have questions, uh, reach out to your local pharmacist or your provider as well, and they can help you determine um, if there's a fall risk associated or not. Um, so you have your opioids, your benzodiazepines, so lorazepam, alprazolam, uh, clonazepam, clonopin, diazepam, Valium is the brand name. Um, muscle relaxers, uh, I have a bunch of them listed there. And then sleeping pills. So these, um, so like the Zilpidem or your Ambien. Um, I also have Trazodone listed on there. It's not technically a sleeping pill, but it's mainly used for uh, sleep or to help people sleep. Um, they all have common side effects. Oops, sorry about that. Um, oh, no. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, drowsiness, um, sedation, and uh, they can make you feel tired and potentially impair your coordination as well. So especially patients who are coming out of surgery, they might be on multiple meds. So opioids or muscle relaxers. Um, but since the side effects are similar between all of these. Uh, it's important to use caution uh, when you're moving around if you're on multiple um, of these types of meds. Um, some other groups here that have fall risks associated with them are your anticonvulsants, your so um, meds that you would take if you have seizures, although some of the meds can also be used for other things. Um, but trying to keep them in their actual approved uh, group of medications. You have, so antipsychotics, which can also be used for antidepression, um, but then, and then you have your antidepressants. So again, a lot of these have similar side effects, sedation being common across all of the groups, um, dizziness or drowsiness, and then um, in your, some of your antipsychotics and your antidepressants can cause blurred vision. Um, and again, just one of these medications may or may not cause these symptoms, but it's really important to consider the effects when you start adding on multiple meds, um, either from the same group or within different groups. Um, some other meds um, that we have overactive bladder medicines that can cause dizziness, blurred vision, um, some delirium, so you might feel a little out of it. Uh, oxybutynin is the one that is uh, mainly associated with those risks. Other medications within this class have less of a fall risk. Um, the over-the-counter meds are definitely something that I wanted to touch upon, especially thinking about allergy medications or some of your combo over-the-counter like cough and cold medicines because it might have some of these medications um, mixed in. So diphenhydramine or your Benadryl, this will also be in over-the-counter sleep aids occasionally as well. Um, Dramamine for like motion sickness and then the chlorpheniramine is commonly in cough and cold. Product. So it's when you're purchasing these, it's uh, important to look at the labels to make sure that you know what it um, to know what's in the combination products that you're that you're taking. The next medications we have are your antihypertensives and your so your medications that you take for your blood pressure or your anti-hyperglycemic, so those that you take if you um, are a diabetic to help control your sugars. For your antihypertensives, the concern is that, they're, that if the doses are too high or if you accidentally take an additional dose, that you can get hypotension, so your blood pressure gets too low. And uh, multiple, there's multiple classes within this group, of so you have your beta blockers so your metoprolol, atenolol, carvedilol, your calcium channel blockers so your diltiazem and verapamil, and then you have your prezosin and doxazosin, terazosin, um, and then for your blood glucose medications, um, not all medications that are taken for diabetes will 
what you like when taken on their own will cause hypoglycemia. The ones most common are insulins, your glipizide, glyburide, or glimepiride, or the newer class of medications, your canagliflozin, empagliflozin, and dipagliflozin. Um, and the concern with becoming either hypotensive or hypoglycemic is that you might feel faint, it might lead you to passing out, you might feel dizzy or lightheadedness, uh, you might be confused, could lead to blurred vision, and also might make you unsteady on your feet if you're walking around. So it's really important to kind of know your numbers and then also be aware of how you feel after any dose changes that your provider um, might prescribe for you. Another group are diuretics. We are also concerned about hypotension uh, with these medications. Um, I have some listed over on the side for an example. Um, and some of them can also cause dizziness as well because you're losing fluid, so you might be a little bit dehydrated. Um, and one point that I would like to make with your diuretics is to try to avoid taking close to bedtime because the closer you take it to bedtime, the more likely it is that you might have to get up at night to go to the bathroom. And whether you're moving around in a dark room um, or you're still half asleep, it might make you more prone to tripping and falling or kind of bumping into something. Uh, so we can avoid having to get up in the middle of the night. It's probably best. Since, uh, you know, we have the new dispensaries that are opening up around in Massachusetts, I just wanted to touch quickly on the cannabis and some of the edibles. Um, so marijuana itself is comprised of THC and CBD. Those are like the two components. The THC containing products can cause hypotension, dizziness, drowsiness. They can make you a little disoriented or impair coordination. Um, the products that are just CBD um, does not have all of those side effects, there's let there's really no disorienta uh, disorientation or you don't get that high from the marijuana, but it still can cause drowsiness, especially if you're using uh, more of it or higher doses. And it's also important to keep in mind that it could interact um, with other medications that you might uh, be taking or consuming at that time. So if you're taking medications that affect your central nervous system, um, or have similar side effects. So if you're also on benzodiazepines or opioids, um, or if you're drinking alcohol at the time, that it might accentuate the, uh, the effects of it. Um, and everyone kind of is gonna react a little bit differently to it. So it's important to know how it makes you feel if you're using these. Um, and then uh, one thing also to consider is that if you do decide to, to make sure that you purchase it from a reputable source. Um, so some of our local dispensaries, just because you'll know what you're getting at that point. Um, and then another thing they do have, I forgot to put it on the slide, but some of the topicals uh, that might be used for pain, uh, those are a lot less uh, likely to cause any uh, of these side effects just because the absorption rate is differently, so. Um, most of these are more likely if you're consuming it as opposed to using it topically in, say, some of the creams. So a little bit uh, differently, so these aren't meds that make or that might increase your risk of falling, but uh, these are meds that might increase the severity of your injury if you were to fall. So these uh, we have your anticoagulants and antiplatelets, and they'll potentially increase your risk of bleeding if you fall. Um, so your anticoagulants, you think of your warfarin or coumadin, your Eliquis, Xarelto, uh, Pradaxa, might be on Lovenox or Erixtra are your injections. Um, and these prevent um, stages of the full clotting process to prevent clots from actually forming. And you're usually on this to make sure that you don't form a clot. <laughs> and antiplatelet agents, they prevent the platelets from sticking together to form a clot. So they work differently, but ultimately have the same effect in the end that you have, you're less prone to developing uh, blood clots. 
But on the other hand, if you have an injury, it's going to slow the rate at which your blood clots. So you'll probably bleed more. And so if you're on warfarin, it's really important to make sure that you keep your INR um, kind of within range so that you get it checked regularly and keep on any of the dietary uh, restrictions that go along with that as well. And then if you fall, make the call. Um, don't wait to get evaluated, especially if you're on any of the anticoagulants or antiplatelets, just because you might feel fine now. However, you still might have a significant injury. So we want to catch that sooner rather than later. Um, because the earlier we figure it out, uh, less chance of um, a significant or permanent injury afterwards. And if you have any questions about any of your medications or any concerns, um, or have whether it be which medications you're on might be uh, causing issues, or if you feel you're currently having issues with your meds, um, you know, just ask your local pharmacist or call your provider and ask them to to sit down and have a discussion about that with you. Um, and I think that is all that I have for today. Um, if you have any other questions, um, I'd be happy to answer them at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Great job. Excellent presentation. Next up, we have Michelle Lantain, Occupational Therapist for Bay State Rehabilitation Care. Hello, everyone. I'm Michelle Lantain. I'm going to share my slideshow with everybody in just a second. And we are going to talk about safety in the home. So uh, the, a lot of the information that I'm going to be sharing today is offered from the CDC. Um, we are going to go through more in-depth ways of, of modifying your home or reorganizing your home to make you more safe. First thing I like to talk about is the floor. Most people fall by slipping, tripping, stumbling on things. So the first thing that people should do is to make sure that while you're walking through your house that you have clear pathways. Remove throw rugs if you can, um, or tack them down with um, sticky back tape or non-slip surfaces underneath so that your rugs don't move while you walk over them. Remove objects that clutter from the ground. There shouldn't be books on the ground. Um, you can group things in baskets or get them off of your pathways to make sure that you don't trip over them while you're walking. Uh, if you're using oxygen in your home, it's really important to make sure that those oxygen tubes that you're using are in an area that you're not going to trip over them. So keep them with you, keep them um, in an area that, that you're not going to trip over. Um, make sure you don't have too much cording where you can't, where you're, you're stumbling over all the extra oxygen tubing. With the floors, we are going to talk about stairs. Stairways need to be clear of any kind of storage uh, materials. There shouldn't be shoes on the stairs. There shouldn't be baskets. Making sure that you can use the stairs and have hand railings possibly on both sides. That way, when you're going up the stairway, you can use it on one hand or both hands, and also when you're coming down the stairs. Um, lighting is really important on the stairways. When you go up and down the stairs, turn on your lights. There's lots of shadows that happen throughout different times of the day and making sure that your walkway area is clear will only help you with having the lights on. Sometimes people also uh, get stairway lights that, that go on um, when it's dark out. So you can tack up uh, little treads on the stairs that will light up when it's um, evening time. From the, from the floors, we're gonna start to move throughout the house. We're gonna talk about the kitchen. Now, the kitchen is an area that is really easy to reorganize so that you are not working so hard getting the materials that you need to function. Position the items that you use frequently in easy to reach locations. And you can organize those materials in a, um, an area such as like a coffee station. If you have coffee, your coffee pot, also an easy area for you to fill up your, your water for your pot. Grouping those like items together makes it so you're not walking back and forth across the kitchen for items that could easily be stored together. Reorganizing your kitchen so that the items that you use most frequently are within reach, that you don't have to bend over, uh, dig through your cabinets, that will make your life easier. And it's a simple way of making modifications to your home that it doesn't involve a lot of money. It involves just uh, thinking about the things that you're using the most often and having them out. 
it's also okay to have those frequently used materials on your counter so that you're not taking them out, putting them away, especially if you have some issues with your balance or if you're using a walker or a cane. Also with a walker or a cane, you should have an area that you can put your materials down on easily, whether it's a place next to you that you can sit down and eat, like a table in an eating kitchen, or if you have a walker with a tray that you can carry those items, it would also make it much safer for you. Along the lines of um, looking for things in the kitchen, you should also be aware if you, if you have any pets. <clears throat> Often people fall because of those unexpected things that happen. If you have cats or dogs, or even if you have grandchildren that are frequently visiting you, the um, pets and children frequently get in our way when you don't expect them. So be aware of where, where they are when you're moving throughout your home and also the feeding areas for your pets. Make sure that those are in an area that you don't have to walk around or that are in an area that you can keep tidy, such as if you're putting, putting water down or frequently spilling um, items for food. The bathroom is the area that we really don't wanna fall in. It has all hard surfaces. You're in a vulnerable position when you're in the bathroom. It's an area that people are really afraid to fall in. Um, be careful when you put throw rugs down in the bathroom, even right in front of the shower. I once had a gentleman who put down a brand new rug right in front of his shower, went to bed, had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and tripped over that rug and ended up fracturing his humerus and had a very long recovery, which again, it goes upon those frequent injuries that Ida was talking about easily that earlier, that we don't want to have things in our pathways when we're walking. Getting in and out of the tub is often a hard thing to do. So there are things you can do to make your, you safer getting in and out of the, the tub. A simple thing to do is to get a grab bar that goes outside of the tub and maybe a grab bar inside of the tub or shower area. That way when you are, you can hold on and step in if you have a step in tub or even just a little ledge that you have to be careful for. If you can't do those things, there is a, there are a variety of different kinds of shower or tub benches or seats that you can use in the shower. Benches come onto the outside of the, of the tub, so you can sit down and then swing your legs into the shower. Or if you're able to step in and then have a seat in the shower, that's another item that may keep you safer in the, in, in the shower. I have to warn people that towel bars are not grab bars. And sometimes people use like ledges of windows or your vanity to get up. Those things are not really designed to be grab bars or to really steady you or help you get out get out of off the toilet or around the bathroom. So a grab bar that could be installed by a professional contractor or somebody who really makes sure that those grab bars get put into the studs would be a safer thing to hold on to, especially if you need help getting up from those lower surfaces. They do make raised toilet seats or also uh, toilet seats that are elevated that are fully just raised toilets that you could have put in your bathroom as another option. Um, I'm gonna okay. step in there. Okay. Go for it. But also, too, when you're remodeling like your bathroom, don't think about what you need today. Think about what you're gonna need in maybe four or five years. So that high toilet seat might come in handy four or five years down the road, mm -hmm. even though you may not need it today. So look into the things like if I'm gonna put grab bars in, even if I don't need them, I might need them somewhere else, you know, in my life. So put them in in spots that are going to help you. Right? No, that's excellent. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, really forward thinking. And, and it may not be somebody who needs help right now, but it's also organizing yourself so you don't get hurt and, and provide with success for the future. We should always have nightlights in the bathroom. You can get automatic mm -hmm. night lights that um, turn on when the lights go out. You can get night lights that you manually turn on. It's so necessary at night when you're walking into the bathroom that you have a light that you can that that you can acclimate to to prevent any kind of falls. Um, I'm going to go back to my tub and shower talk because I forgot this part, portion of it. On um, the last but uh, bullet bullet on my slide it talks about non skid or texturizing the bottom of your tub or shower. Um, in alignment with what Nancy said, if we're if you're going to invest money in fixing up your bathroom. Something to think about is making sure the bottom of your surface that you're that you're standing on, whether it be a tub, whether it be the shower floor, has a texture on it that provides slip that is a non-slip surface. Um, stepping into the shower because they're wet, you will you can easily slip. Um, you can get stickers that go on the bottoms of your tub to give you some gripping, or you can also have your tubs recoated 
So there's lots of varieties of ways to update these things for your safety. Great. All right, again, talking about things at night, um, Ida mentioned this earlier. It's really important that your lamps are close to your bed, that you can reach and turn on that light if you need to get up at night. If you have to, if you're somebody who frequently gets up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, safety is the most important thing. Do you have a walker or a cane next to your bed so you can get up and use it appropriately? Do you have a light that you can turn on? Because walking in the dark isn't a good idea. You have to turn on a, a dim light. Um, something to be aware of, if you turn on a full light that comes on, you actually lose some of your vision when you're turning on a very bright light. That's why we recommend night lights because your eyes acclimate a little bit easier when you open your eyes in the dark. So sometimes they have those bulbs. And I think Nancy's talked about this before. Yeah. Me. Um, there are, sorry, we're in a, she knows I'm the comical part of this. <laughs> Nancy mentioned to me that last week that she has these light bulbs that yes. you put into your lamps and they gradually increase to their full brightness. Right. 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 So it makes our eyes adjust to the lights easier than turning it on and having that brightness when you walk in. Sometimes they can blind us when we're walking yeah. into the room. So yeah. So yeah. having those gradual lights make make a very make a lot of sense to keep you safe, especially in your room. Yeah. And again, at night, make sure that you have a clear path from your bedroom to the bathroom. We never know when we have to get up in the middle of the night. Make sure that the, that path is ready for you. Um, some people, if they use a walker or a cane, I've had some patients do wonderful things like attach a flashlight to uh, a portion of their handle so they can just click a button and use that so they have kind of like a low, low level light that will help guide them to the bathroom, um, which is a great op option. Mm -hmm. And you can even do that to your walker. Yeah, you can do that yep. to your cane, your walker. Yep. Um, on your walker can, too. Some people just have flashlights next to their bed. So yeah, it's one of those things that you could use easily exactly. if you don't want to turn on a full light in the middle of the night. No one wants to fully wake up, but it's important that you're awake enough to prevent a fall. All right, so I have just some miscellaneous safety tips that I want to go over. Um, Keep a cell phone or a house phone with you when you're doing things throughout the house. Have something within reach. The worst thing to do is to be is to fall and then not have a way to get help. Um, that being said, some people do have lifelines, but more frequently now, people are getting, um, I'm going to suggest like the Amazon Echo or the mm -hmm. Alexa, because you can program those machines to be able to ask for help. So if you're on the ground and you can't get up, you can say, hey, Alexa, Call my daughter. Hey, Alexa, call 911. And those things will help you use your cell phones in the home. Um, and a lot of patients are using it because they are, they are, they're a lot less expensive than a lifeline if, if you're questioning that for financial reasons. Um, and, to get help, help and to be fast. able to get help faster. Yes. Um, there's nothing worse than being on the ground and not and not knowing and are trying to plan how you're going to get up and try to get help where you can have a serious injury. Right. You know, the, the less time you have to spend on that floor, it's the less amount of time damage is being done to you. So you want to get help as soon as you can. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, when you a lot of people, when they first stand up, feel a little bit dizzy. And I think especially at night or when you're transitioning through your home, if you're somebody who feels that way. I think it's important to make sure you stand up and get your bearings before we're moving. Mm -hmm. We often are moving a mile a minute and we don't think to do those things. Um, I think it's a really good tip to just take a minute, stand up, get your bearings, and then proceed. It doesn't always happen, but it's something to think about if you do find that you're getting a little bit dizzy when you're standing up. Think about making sure that you have railings if you have steps in your house, not just what we talked about earlier, going up the stairs with two railings, but also going in and outside of your house. Um, my father-in-law recently just put a little handle on the outside right next to the front door because he had one step to go up and he just really was struggling doing that. And that little, um, that little solid handle helps him do that. And it really is, it is a safety measure. You can always get hand railings um, put into those steps outside as well. But getting in and out of the house is something that you do all the time. And falling when, you, when you're trying to get to an appointment or when you're trying to come home isn't, that's not pleasant at all. Um, speaking of being outside, when you are outside, be aware of the hazards on the ground and the uneven surface. Um, we all, being in New England, we think of that frequently when we're outside in the cold weather. But even right now, you know, there's been a lot of critters running around at night. Who knows if they tipped over a plant at night or there's something on the ground that you're not expecting or sand, um, things of that sort. And another fun fact is that getting in and out of cars 
has one of the highest fall risks there is. Um, when you are getting in and out of your car, people often are looking in the parking lot and seeing what's going on around them in their environment, but not necessarily looking straight down at the ground. So when you are getting in and out of the car, look around you, see what's near you, make sure that you fully open your door. And there should always be two points of contact on the ground. So either your, your foot on the ground and your hand on the surface. So something has to be in a solid surface when you're, when you're making those transitions. Um, we call it like the three point rule. You put your foot on the ground, your hands are on the door and on the roof of the car, and then you're guiding yourself to sit. Or you sit down first in your car and then swing your legs in. That's a really simple way to make sure that there aren't those transitions of, of falls while you're moving in those spaces if you have decreased balance. Um, falls frequently happen in unfamiliar areas during travel. It's that time of the year where people are visiting family, friends. With COVID, a lot of people have kind of kept to themselves and been in their homes. Almost everywhere right now is kind of an unfamiliar area. Um, be aware of those environmental things, like, you know, things on people. Uh, if you're visiting a friend that you haven't seen in a long time, if they have a cat, or if you're visiting a friend and they have uh, new floors and they have new rugs, you have to look around in those environments as you're moving and know that those things are things you're not expecting to feel differently because it is a new situation. And the same goes for when you're traveling in different areas. Um, as we're tired or as we're distracted by other things in our environment, we're at a higher risk for falls. All right, if anyone has any questions or any other tips, you're welcome to enter those into the question answer chat box and we'll go over those at the end. But I'm gonna introduce my friend, Nancy Densmore, physical therapist, and we're, she's an assistant, a physical <laughs> therapy assistant, I'm sorry. Um, and we're gonna go over keeping you moving. Hi everyone, how you doing? So my part usually is a fun part, but we've been seeing a lot of people falling and coming to see us lately. And we really wanna take this serious and want you all to be aware of this. So I have some questions for you. We're gonna put them up on the screen. And my questions. Yeah. So we're going to put some questions on the screen, okay? Okay, uh, and answer them as honestly as you can. Have you had a fall in the past year? Think about that. How about do you feel unsteady when you're walking or when you're moving? And did you have a fear of falling this year or any year? The problem is, is that a lot of people start to fall or if they have fallen, that fear of falling can help, can make us fall because we're so afraid to put our feet down, we're afraid to move. And what happens is when we don't move, then we lose the ability to be able to be strong. All right, I have patients that come to us and talk to me and say, oh, it's not that I'm not strong, but my balance is off. But it's not your balance that's off, it's your strength that keeps you standing up. Like Ida said, keep strong, and you can keep moving. So now the other thing is, is that I always say that they lie to us. You know, we could sit in the rocking chair and sit and watch everybody walk by and wave and drink our lemonade. And we thought that's gonna be our golden years. And then I've had many people tell me that the golden years are not golden. And you know what I say to them? It's because you stopped moving. We cannot stop moving. We can. We have to keep ourselves going, and that's what keeps us strong. We have to get up, get moving, and um, and get going. So what I like to do is I also talk to people about getting in and out of a chair. That seems to be a big problem for a lot of people. We almost lose that ability of being able to stand up properly and not fall. So what we want to do is, if you're watching, and you can have the ability to do this while we're, while we're talking, I want you to scoot forward in your chairs. What you're going to do is make sure both your feet are on the floor and you scoot forward, but slide your feet underneath you just a little bit. And when you go to stand up, we lean forward and we stand up. All right. If you have um, railings on your um, chair, just push through those chairs and get up. But I also want you to have the ability to get up from a chair when you don't have um, arm railings. So you, what you want to do is make sure you lean forward, you reach up, and get your arms out in front of you. All right? The other thing I have is I have some exercises I'd like to show you. So we have three exercises. Just something to get us moving, because we've all been sitting here listening to all of us talking. So we need to get ourselves going, because that's what this is all about, moving. All right, we're going to bring this up. So the first one we have here 
is called heel and toe. So what we want to do is we want to move our toes and get on our toes and push our heels up and hold that for a count of one, two, and three. Now we want to rock back onto our heels and bring our toes up. And we hold that for one, two, and three. And we proceed to do this 10 times every day. Do this a couple times because we want to get those muscles moving. We want to get the fluid out of our legs that's from sitting too long. You know, we all sit there and I have people say, I'm like, well, Al, what are you doing all day? And they're like, well, I, I get up a lot. And I'm like, well, did you watch a program? What we don't realize is that an hour goes by very quickly. And when we don't get off that chair, it gets more difficult to get up. So during commercials, get up, go get a drink of water, go to the bathroom, stand up, do some exercises, just sitting and standing a couple of times, something to get you up out of that chair. The second exercise we're gonna do is, we're gonna lift our knees up a little bit to our chest. We're gonna hold it for a count of one, two, and three, and bring it back down. We're gonna do the other side now, lifting up our knee up and holding that for one, two, and three. So we're gonna do that for also a count of 10. You can do this every day, and it's good for our strength, and it's good for our muscles. We have one more exercise I'm gonna show you. And we're gonna stick our leg out in front of us. So we're gonna scoop back in our chair all the way because we wanna make sure our upper thigh is well supported. We bring our leg out in front of us. We hold it for a count of three, one, two, three, and we bring it down. And then we'll do the other side, lifting it up and holding that for one, two, and three. So these are just basic exercises, but what these three exercises do is this is the way we walk. We have our foot behind us. So our foot actually toes have to press down to bring our leg forward. When we're doing the one where we bring our leg up, it's the one where our leg, our, uh, our leg has to go up and our knees slightly bent. When we're doing this one that the picture is on the screen, we bring our leg out and then we hit down with our heel. These three exercises have to do with just basic walking. But what we want to do is, uh, when we talked about those three questions, are you finding yourself drifting around, especially when you're walking? Oh, we got to sit to stands. We're, there Sorry. we have. That's okay. We got our pictures of sit to stands too. So remember, we talked about that: scooting forward, leaning forward, and standing up. We got to get that technique. If you don't, if you can't get off that chair, check your technique of what you're doing, and that's going to get you up. All right. Sorry, my fault. That's all right. <laughs> so then. So like I said, the other thing is, is, do you find yourself when you're walking, are you drifting a little bit to one side, maybe another? Are you bumping into that wall that just showed up and you hit it a little bit? Those are also signs that our body is getting a little weak and that we could fall. And we don't want to wait to fall because so many of my patients have come just this year and said they've got stitches, they hurt themselves, they have that fear of falling. And they look scared, and I've never seen them like that before. So this last year really took a lot out of us. So what we do in the balance act is, we'll check your, your strengths. We'll show you the places where you're weak. We'll give you basic exercises, which some are lying and sitting and standing. We're going to challenge your balance. Remember when we were kids? We always challenged our balance. We always walked on the railroad tracks, or we played hopscotch, or you ran up that hill and rolled down it. We were always challenging our balance when we were young. But now, as we get older, and even the way life is now, all the surfaces are flat. We don't want to fall. We don't even walk on the grass anymore because, you know, there's always signs. Do not walk on grass, poison, and all this other stuff. But those are things that challenge our balance and kept us strong. So when we don't do those kind of things, our body tends to change the surfaces we're constantly using. So we want to get moving, get moving, get strong. And in our class, like I said, we'll teach you exercises, balance, we'll work on endurance. But what you have to do is go see your doctor. You get a script from your doctor to come and see us for, and for the falls um, class. And then we it's about an eight a session. Yeah, eight sessions we do with you. And we'll teach you all these things. We'll look at how you're doing. And when you leave us, you'll have pictures. You'll know what to do every single day. And hopefully you'll be walking out even better than you're walked in. All right? So I'm going to give back to everybody. Okay.
And one of the biggest things Nancy was just talking about is yeah. that um, that's what basic rehabilitation care services. We have uh, locations mm -hmm. in Springfield, East Longmeadow, Aguam, South Hadley, Westfield, um, and also all uh, other divisions in Franklin and Mary Lane. Um, and we, we offer services that specify yes. our balance program. Mm -hmm. So that is an eight session program for physical therapy that we address these issues with falling and strengthening and balance. Right. Um, and we go over those things in, the, in that class, um, such as like modifying your home, um, safety in your home. Right. Um, Using adapted equipment adapted. when we're dating. Absolutely. Make sure that all your canes and your walkers are at the right height for you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, see, making you as strong and as independent right. for as long as you can. Right. Because it's been a long, it, it, no matter what people have had medically going on, it's also mm -hmm. been a really long year of people being isolated. Right. So we are here to keep you moving. To get you out, to get you back to the life you want want back absolutely that's what we got to do all right thank you thank thank you both well done great job you're a good team <laughs> uh now we're going to hand it over to Erin so that she can moderate the uh q a so we invite our attendees to type in the questions into the q a box excellent great job everybody thanks sue I can see that there's two questions in queue. One is from Denise, and she's asking, will there be a printout for the exercises? Sue, I don't know if it's possible for us. I know we're recording the, the class, the session that we've done today. Um, if it's possible, we can um, maybe send the exercises in a link to the participants. Would that be helpful? Yeah, we could do that. I actually can email everyone who registered for the event the recording. In addition to that, we can provide the exercises that Nancy demonstrated today. And for sure, if if anybody pursues the physical therapy sessions at Bay State Rehab, um, you are provided with a, a packet of printed exercises that are individualized for your program and our and our protocol. Okay, um, the the second question that I can see is, uh, are there balance classes in Berkshire County? Um, I don't know specifically where you are out in the Berkshires, but as, as Michelle mentioned, um, our Falls Prevention Program, our physical therapy sessions, are a regional program that we have throughout all of our Bay State Rehab locations. Um, all the way up to Franklin Medical Center, Franklin Rehab, uh, which is part of Bay State. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any, I, I think that would be your closest option. Um, and, and if you called our, our access center at 413-794-5600, it's option number three you could speak with someone and they'd be able to uh, take your information about where you live and where our closest location would be to your home. There is a couple of questions at the top of the Q&A box, Erin. I don't know if you can see those. Um, I can't, maybe, uh, oh. do you wanna read them off and then we'll sure. try to address them? Sure. Um, the first question is from Linda. Is there a difference between being dizzy and being lightheaded? That's a great question. Ida, do you want to take that and then? Um, I'm going to refer it to Michelle because we, we talked about it and, and she kind of had a, a really good answer for that. Go ahead. Okay. Nancy and I have been talking about this. Again. Yeah. <laughs> The question would be to the person too is, is the room spinning or is it spinning uh, in the lightheadedness in our heads? So are we seeing it outside or are we feeling it inside when we're doing that? Um, dizziness can come from anything from vertigo to medications, to blood pressure. To vision. So, to vision, vision. exactly. So these are the things you would address with your doctor for sure. Mm -hmm. So he can eliminate the other things that are not involved in it. Um, and then go from there. So, great, thank you. Um, the next question is 
I fell twice in my garden, both times on my right side. Is there anything significant about falling on one side? So again, what's happening is the side you're falling on is probably your stronger side because your weaker side you don't want to fall on because the body says, I have to protect ourselves from, say it's your right side that is your weaker side. So you're, you're not going to want to put your weight over there. You're not going to want to put um, anything in, into that area. So we tend to, to rely on our strongest side, which if it was the left side, it would be less side. So if you're starting to fall, we tend to want to go to the side that we think is going to protect us. And what happens is, is that we tend to fall onto our stronger side, but you're going to start hurting it. And when you start hurting it, now you're not going to have the ability to either side to help you. So that's the kind of stuff that you want to come to therapy to get yourself assessed. Mm -hmm. And then we can uh, um, give you exercises to get you stronger. So you're not falling. And things I would address is what what type of gardening are you doing? Are you standing when you're falling? Are you setting up your environment? safely to make sure that, you know, are you doing too much on one side? Are you doing too much? Are you pulling, pushing, digging? Um, so it's definitely something that you'd have to see a provider for to get more information. But it's a really good question. That was a good question. Here's another great question from Susan. Does swimming help with balance or core strength? Yes. Oh, yeah. Always, always working all around. Everything is being used, especially if you can get to swimming and use big movements and, and repetitive, um, uh, again, repetitive movements. Yep. And you're using your resistance of the water to strengthen up your muscles. So, yes, any type of movement, just get moving. That's the most yeah. important thing. It's great for you. You're using that resistance, yeah. like Nancy said, in the water. You're moving your whole body. Yeah. Um, it's definitely a core workout. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's a great activity to do. Yeah. I can see a question from Maria. Uh, can allergies or sinus pressure cause dizziness? Well, there he is. I yes. said yes. <laughs> right I do too. I say yes too. Yes. A lot of people are dealing with, with all the allergies. Yes. But again, that's something you want to address with your doctor because mm -hmm. you want to take care of that because if you get dizzy just from a sinus um, pressure and all that, you're going to fall and get, get, get hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're trying to prevent that. Yeah, so you should definitely look at that medically yeah. um, because there could be so many reasons from medications to sinus pressure to all those things that could be causing or contributing to that dizziness. Yeah. Right, Ida? Yes, absolutely. I agree with you guys. 100%. <laughs> so I can't see any other questions. Sue, are there any that I'm not seeing or have we answered them? Yeah, I think we've answered all of them, and we're just about at time. So, Wonderful. Um, what a lot of information. We'd like to thank the audience, of course, for joining us today. And um, we'll be sending out more information with the recording and the exercises. But thank you to you, Aaron, Ida. Sure. Danielle, Michelle, Nancy, what a comprehensive event for people who are thinking about their balance and their fear of possible falling. Thank you for having us. This was great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. you did the right thing by signing on and joining the group for education about falls prevention.